It was an overcast Easter morning in Wiltshire, England, when Victoria Silliers was set to go out on a routine skydive. She and the group of divers she was jumping with were delayed several times due to inclement weather, which only contributed to Victoria's nervousness. Normally, such a jump for this seasoned skydiving instructor would not invoke any anxiety whatsoever. She had made thousands of jumps prior to that without incident. But, having given birth to her youngest child just five weeks prior to that, she didn't feel ready. But the jump was a gift from her husband, and he would be disappointed if she didn't go through with it. So, she did. Once in the air, she reached to deploy her parachute. But, the cords were tangled. She wasn't at all alarmed. She knew that she had a reserve parachute for just such incidents. So, she deployed it. But the life-saving reserve parachute did not properly deploy either. A one in a million occurrence. She tried diligently to rectify the situation as she hurtled toward the ground in an uncontrollable spin at over 60 miles per hour. Never certain how much time she had, just laser-focused on trying to remedy her dire situation. But sadly, she was not successful. Welcome back to Crime A to Z, where we detail cases and criminals from their very beginning till well after other reporting ends. With so many off-the-rail twisted cases lately, we thought we might switch things up with what we thought would be a pretty straightforward case. But we were wrong. So sit tight as Emile and Victoria Silliers take us on a twisted murder plot ride that is nowhere near straightforward. And before we get started, if you like how we present this case, please help us out by hitting like and subscribe. Let's go. By all accounts, Victoria Silliers was impressive. Born in Edinburgh, the capital of Scotland, Vicky, as her friends and family knew her, attended the University of Glasgow and studied to become a physiotherapist. She went on to achieve the rank of captain in the British Royal Army. In addition to being a physiotherapist, Victoria was also an accelerated free-fall skydiving instructor who had completed over 2,600 jumps without a single incident. She was skilled not just at diving, but at training and rescuing novice jumpers. According to the chief instructor who ran the operation where she worked, she could chase them around the sky during free fall, catch them, and get them into the right position mid-air. He called it a real, hardcore skill. Then, in 2010, when she was 34 years old, Vicky met 30-year-old Emil Silliers. Emil had grown up just outside of Johannesburg, South Africa, but had relocated to the UK. Emil also served in the Royal Army and was connected with Vicky after a skiing injury. Emil was a thoughtful and loving partner, giving Vicky all of his attention and affection. Vicky was smitten, and the couple got married a year later in Cape Town, South Africa. Afterward, they returned to Wiltshire, England to live in the home that Vicky had purchased with her inheritance. They soon welcomed two children. First, a daughter named April in 2012. Then in 2015, a son named Ben. With Vicky being no stranger to skydiving, the Easter morning jump that her husband gifted her so that she could, quote, do something she enjoyed, should not have triggered any nervousness at all. But Vicky hadn't jumped in nearly a year, given that she just completed her nine-month pregnancy and given birth to her son a mere five weeks prior. She felt that she needed to be at home with her newborn and daughter, far more than she needed to be jumping, and she just wasn't ready to return to the adrenaline-packed action of skydiving. Now or possibly ever. But she'd agreed to it, because originally the jump was supposed to be something she and Emil did together, both of them. And given that she felt their marriage was crumbling, she was just pleased that he wanted to do something together with her. But that fell apart the day before the jump. That afternoon, they were supposed to jump together, but the weather forced them to cancel. So the following morning, Vicky would be jumping without Emil. Even though he wouldn't be joining her, she knew he would be disappointed if she didn't take the jump. So, on that fateful morning, she, along with a group of other jumpers, waited out the overcast weather. The extra delays were not helping her nerves. The weather finally cleared enough to venture out. And while the jump was originally planned to take place from the typical altitude of about 13,000 feet, the plane stayed low, 
nothing over 5,000 feet. That way the jumpers could perform what's called a hop and pop, a simple jump that could be completed quickly given the weather challenges. They approached the broad, flat area that was designated as the jump zone. Vicky began her dive and went to pull the release on her main parachute. But the cords were tangled. She briefly tried in vain to untangle them, but realized it was useless. So, she decided to deploy her reserve parachute, something typically needed about once every 750 jumps. Not a big deal at all, and no cause for panic. It's what the reserve parachute is there for. But then even that parachute also failed. It would only open and fill out halfway, which was as ineffective as it not opening at all. Falling 3,000 feet at over 60 miles per hour, Vicky hit the ground. Miraculously, she survived. After the fall, she regained consciousness and was assisted by another jumper who happened to be a doctor. She recalls wondering what all the fuss was about and that she didn't feel any pain. The fall resulted in almost all her ribs on one side being fractured, a broken collarbone and pelvis, spinal fractures, and bleeding in her lung. Her light weight, the relatively low altitude from which she jumped, and the softness of the newly plowed field that she landed in, breaking her fall, all contributed to her surviving what would most certainly have normally been a fatal fall. Mark Bayada, the chief instructor who ran the skydiving facility, was immediately suspicious. Both a main parachute and the reserve parachute malfunctioning almost never happens. So, he immediately started investigating. He examined Vicky's parachutes, looking for any potential cause of the malfunctions. He found that the main parachute's cords were, indeed, tangled. And the reserve parachute was, surprisingly, missing two important attachments, called slinks. He looked closely for any loose stitching in the harness with canopy, excessive pressure indicators on the straps, or anything else that might explain why the slinks were missing. But there was none. He could not find any evidence of a mechanical or equipment failure of any kind. And he also discovered that even though Vicky's reserve parachute had never been deployed, it had been inspected 16 times by 10 separate advanced packers over its lifetime, including just two months before Vicky's tragic jump. The slinks were present during each inspection. He called the police, and they launched an investigation. Meanwhile, the BPA, or British Parachute Association, which is the sport's national governing body, is called in to inspect the parachute. According to the BPA, there were approximately 2.3 million skydiving jumps in the 10 years prior to Victoria's 2015 Easter jump. And of those, 2,900 of them involved the reserve parachute being deployed. Of those 2,900, not one of them encountered a single problem deploying the reserve parachute. According to the BPA, the only known instance where both the main and reserve parachutes failed to operate was in the case of Stephen Hilder, a case which every serious skydiver knows about. Hilder was a 20-year-old officer cadet who fell 13,000 feet to his death in 2003 in Hebold Stow in Lincolnshire. Someone had cut the risers on his reserve parachute. The case is widely suspected throughout the skydiving community to have been murder. But still, the BPA didn't expect to find any foul play, and proceeded to look for signs of some unfortunate mechanical failure. But they were wrong. Their findings were the same as Bayada's. They couldn't find any evidence of mechanical failure. They reported their finding to the police. That finding, along with a close friend of Vicky's coming forward to say she'd witnessed a strange, toxic, mentally abusive relationship between the couple, was enough for police to arrest Emil. And, on April 28th, 2015, they did. They interrogated him for six hours, during which time he was self-assured and arrogant. You went to get Victoria a parachute? Yes. Tell me about the checks you did. It's just standard checks, as you should do as a parachutist. Okay, well tell me what those standard checks are. I, d I don't know, I don't parachute. <sighs> okay, I'm sure you can investigate and ask the right questions to the right people in regards to checking a parachute. Okay, I'm, I'm asking you, Emil, because you, you obviously right. did, the, did the checks. Yes. I so, would just do the standard checks. What are those standard checks? Um, he did, however, willingly volunteer that he wasn't happy in his relationship with Vicky. Tell me about your relationship with Victoria. Uh, 
yeah. it's not a marriage that I would want to be in anymore. Um, I can't see myself being in the marriage in 10, 15 years time. Throughout the interrogation, he readily revealed that he was having an affair with an Austrian skydiving instructor named Stephanie Goller that he'd met on Tinder. He also admitted that he was in debt to payday loan companies. And he was also having an affair with his ex-wife. And to investigators' surprise, he also volunteered that on the afternoon before Vicky's tragic jump, he had disappeared into a bathroom at the skydiving center for some time with Vicky's parachute kit on his back. And then the floodgates opened. Emil started readily revealing details that no one expected. He had basically just shared with investigators both a motive for why he killed his wife and the means by which he could have done it. Knowing full well that they would find out all such information on their own once they went through his phone, which they had already confiscated. Investigators noted, he was very clever. He covered all the points he knew we were going to discover from looking at his phone. He assumed we were going to accept what he was saying and that he'd never see us again. While Emil was being interrogated, police went to the Sillier's home to inform Vicky of Emil's arrest for attempting to murder her. She was shocked. She couldn't fathom that her husband could even think of doing such a thing to her. She told them that she and Emil's marriage was a good one, with the normal ups and downs of a relationship. Although she did acknowledge suspicions that he was having an affair, she also told officers that Emil had only been in the bathroom with her parachute kit for about two to three minutes. Toward the end of the conversation, police asked Vicky a broad question. They asked whether she could think of anything out of the ordinary that occurred around the time of the accident. There was. She did not think anything of it at the time or even right then as she was telling them. But she recalled that about a week prior to the accident, there was a gas leak. The stovepipe in the kitchen had come loose, filling the home with gas overnight. When she woke up the next morning, she noticed the smell of gas. Emil was not home. He had stayed the night at the army barracks so that he could get an early start there the next day. That left Vicky and the children in the gas-filled home. Vicky assured the officers that it was an accident and that Emil was not responsible for it. But they thought otherwise. The situation was highly suspicious and they wondered whether the parachute accident was not Emil's first attempt on his wife's life. Vicky maintained her position that her husband had not tried to kill her. Not from the fall, not from the gas leak. So police tried a different approach. They shared Emil's interrogation interview with her so she could see firsthand what he had acknowledged, including his free-flowing admission about the affairs and his lack of interest in their marriage. Vicky was shocked and hurt Although she suspected Emil was having an affair, she wasn't aware he was having multiple affairs, including with Stephanie, multiple escorts he called on. And the one that was the biggest blow to Vicky, Emil's ex-wife, Carly, with whom Emil had two children. Vicky had had a friendly and cooperative relationship with Carly, even allowing her at times to watch her children. The betrayal was heartbreaking. Vicky also learned that Emil had planned to leave her once Ben was six weeks old to go live with his girlfriend, Stephanie. Emil had also told Stephanie that Vicky had cheated on him and that Ben was not his son. Also, the debt that Emil had accumulated turned out to be far greater than what he had told her, in part due to spending it on a vacation with his girlfriend. It was all devastating. But the strategy worked. Vicky was ready to talk. She shared everything about Emil, starting with his pattern of destruction when it came to relationships. It started when Emil still lived in South Africa. When he was 17, he began dating his first girlfriend, Nicoline. Three years later, Nicoline and Emil welcomed a daughter. Then a year after that, a son. Although not married, the couple lived together in a committed relationship with their young family until Emil decided to take a working vacation to the UK. The plan was for him to earn some extra cash to bring home to his family afterward. But he didn't. He relocated permanently to the UK, leaving his mother to break the devastating news to Nicoline, who was awaiting his return. He had joined the British Army and married his first wife, Carly. Vicky also shared with police details about the gas leak. She recalled how when she found that the gas valve was loose, she texted Emil about the smell. He replied, That's odd. Is the oven working? 
Knowing better, Vicky did not try to turn the oven on. And instead, she jokingly replied to his text, saying, Are you trying to kill me? She expected an equally jovial response. But instead, Emil was defensive, denying that he was trying to kill her. And then the bombshell. She revised the time frame that Emil was in the bathroom with her parachute kit. From 2 to 3 minutes. To 5 to 10 minutes. With that, investigators conducted an experiment in the tiny bathroom at the skydiving center. For starters, it just didn't make sense that someone would lug such a large kit into such a tiny stall, especially with the intent to actually use the bathroom. However, if someone did, they attempted to see if the parachutes could be tampered with in the manner that Vicky's were, in the amount of time that a male had. They could. They estimated that the tampering could be completed within five minutes. In 2017, Emil faced two counts of attempted murder. The prosecution argued that Emil attempted to kill his wife on two separate occasions to get the money from a £120,000 life insurance policy, which would allow him to pay off his debts with money to spare. There was actually no direct evidence linking him to either of the suspected attempted murders. They presented racy texts that Emil had sent to his two lovers some of which were sent while he was either by his wife's side in the hospital after the accident or while she was in the hospital, giving birth to their son. And then, a final twist. With years having passed since the actual murder attempt, Vicky now took the stand during Emil's trial and hindered the prosecution's arguments. She pondered whether her main parachute was actually usable and whether she had cut it away erroneously to get to her reserve. She also, again, recanted the time frame that Emil was in the bathroom with her kit, now reverting the time frame to the original two to three minutes. She had explained her switch about a year prior to that to police. She said, I wanted to cast suspicion on him. I wanted revenge. I had been ridiculed. Now, she'd been ridiculed because she found out that her husband was having an affair with a woman that he'd met. She said some of the evidence that she gave originally uh, wasn't exact. It wasn't necessarily the exact truth. She now says that it was between two to three minutes. Uh, and so she has reversed what she originally said. And she says she did that because she wanted to get her own back on him. The jury deliberated for eight days, at which point two of the jurors had to be released due to stress-related illnesses brought on by the trial. So, a mistrial was declared. Emil's retrial was held in the spring of 2018. It resulted in him being found guilty on all counts. He was sentenced to life in prison with a chance of parole after 18 years. Detective Inspector Paul Franklin stated, from the outset, Emil Silliers showed no remorse for what he had done. He lied all the way through two trials, but in the end, Justice won out with the guilty verdicts, and now, a long prison sentence. Days after the verdict was handed down, Vicky appeared on talk shows stating that she had not come to terms with the verdict, and that she didn't have any plans to divorce her husband. I still can't quite get to grips with the whole, my husband tried to kill me slant, um, especially as for both incidents, I was there, and I still can't remember or think of an opportunity when he actually did these things. So that's part of the reason that I'm struggling to process it all. She also stated that, I have to go, I suppose, with the verdict. It's almost like peer pressure to conform. My family, friends, everyone seems to think they know more than I do. They see different evidence to me. He'd been unfaithful, he'd had issues with money, but that is not attempted murder. Yes, I'm hurt and angry, but can I see him as capable of murder? No. Given Vicky's reluctance and often outright contradictions throughout the case and afterward, investigators concluded that this was a case where justice was served for a victim who didn't actually want it. They stated, Wiltshire Police is dedicated in bringing offenders like Silliers to justice, as well as giving help to those who find themselves in subtle, abusive, and coercive relationships, like the one highlighted here. After the verdict, Vicky visited Emil in prison weekly, in an attempt to get him to answer the litany of questions swirling around in her head. It ultimately got to the point where they were talking on the phone daily. Emil continued to manipulate Vicky, telling her that she was all that he had. Although that part may have actually been true. As not a single other friend, family member, or co-worker visited him in prison or even showed up at trial to support him. 
And just as it was seeming that Vicky was back under his control, she came around. She finally realized that Emil had been manipulating and controlling her their entire marriage. So she cut it off, filed for divorce amidst his protests that the marriage was still viable, and in 2019, she published a book titled, I Survived. I married a charming man, then he tried to kill me. Why do you visit him in prison? I had so many questions. The main one being why, and all the suspicions I'd had over the years. I had a whole page of questions I wanted to ask him. Um, and I thought, I suppose, that I may get some answers. Do you think there was an element of control there? Yes, completely. And actually writing the book made it a lot more obvious because you're in chronological order, you're going through the issues or the, the concerns or little niggles at the back of my mind, that actually it all starts making sense. That, yes, yeah, slowly and gradually, I was being manipulated um, and abused mentally. Vicky has moved on, has a boyfriend, and has been working to both repair her credit, her heart, and her trust, all of which Emil ravaged. When asked if she believes Emil is capable of love, she replied, I don't know, but I like to think he loves his children. I hope he does. In 2022, Emil and Nicolene's son, Trevor, now an adult, decided that he wanted to speak with his father in prison. He had questions, stating, I want to reach out because I never knew him properly, and I have so many questions for him about why he left my mum. And if he was to give the right answers, I wouldn't rule out building some sort of relationship with him in the future. His daughter didn't share that feeling. She wanted nothing to do with him. And their grandmother, likewise, is happy that he's locked up and believes that her daughter, Nicolene, dodged a bullet. We're inclined to agree with that. What are your thoughts about this case, this man, and the pull he seemed to have on practically everyone? Please share what you think in the comments below. And as usual, if you like how we presented this case, we really appreciate your quick tap on like and definitely hit subscribe so you don't miss a single video.